First of all, welcome. I'm going to first take you way back, and then I'm going to take you way in the, in the future. So we're going to talk about quantum materials, the next frontier. So throughout our existence here on the planet, we've always used the level of technology to describe the state of society. We had the Ice Age. We've had the Stone Age, the Bronze Age the Industrial Age, the Atomic Age, the Nuclear Age, the Space Age, the Information Age. And in 2000, we entered what's called the Nano Age. And the Nano Age has led us to the Quantum Age. And these two represent a fundamental shift in the way in which we do science, the way in which we view the world. So for the first time, we're able to build things from the most fundamental things that we know about, atoms and molecules. And they are leading to some rather startling kinds of new devices, gadgets and gadgets that will take us beyond 2020. So let me just tell you a little bit about this road. It started out for me and this is really the story of my life. As a sixth grader in Denver, Colorado, I learned how to repair radios and televisions. In fact, I didn't even have what they called a tube tester. I would take my tubes to the local drugstore, and I made an agreement with them that if they let me use their tube tester, I would buy my tubes from them. And so it was a very lucrative business, by the way. First, I started out with my relatives. Then the word got around the neighborhood, and I was fixing everybody's television and radio. And I made so much money that we bought the first color TV in our neighborhood. And man, was that something. Every Sunday, people would pile into our house. My mother would cook sweet potato pies. And there were only two shows on in color at that time. One was called Bonanza. And the other one was the Ed Sullivan Show. And so that was our entertainment. And so. Later, we had the transistor radio. And man, was that something. You could carry your sound around with you. <laughs> and of course, you didn't have any, even, you didn't even have AM, FM. All you had was AM. So it didn't sound that good, but didn't matter. In 1970, Intel introduced the first microprocessor. That first microprocessor was very small and didn't do a whole lot. And then in 1980, we had our first cell phone. Well, we called it a mobile phone because it really was a mobile phone. It weighed about a pound or so. And now, of course, we have laptops and small computers that do all kinds of fancy things for us. But if you look at the speed of a microprocessor, it hasn't changed dramatically in the last three years. It's about three gigahertz. And that's because we're starting to reach the fundamental limit as to how fast we can make electronics based on silicon technology. And three rather interesting events took place. The first one was the discovery of a new mate material that had been around for a long time called graphene. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. We also discovered something called a topological insulator. And we also discovered something called the NV center in diamond. 
Now, these three events are leading us to new ways in which we can do electronics to get us beyond the 2020 barrier. And hopefully, I'll try to explain that as best as I can. The goal here is to take atomic layers, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Atomic layers are single planes of atoms. Graphene is one of those materials, and there are other types of materials to make electronic devices out of. We also have the topological insulator, and think of that as the wire that connects the fast, super fast material. And then we have something called the NV center and diamond, which actually can store information for us. So up until this point, most of our work has been on the charge of an electron. And now we can begin to exploit some of the other properties of the electron, something called the spin, which is a quantum kind of phenomenon. And the way we classically think of that is, a ball spinning in clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Now this sheet of graphene, this is it right here, chicken wire as we might call it, is made out of carbon. And carbon is of course one of the most abundant elements. And what we've been able to do is to isolate single sheets of carbon. And these single sheets of carbon have some rather remarkable properties. It's so strong that an elephant could stand on a sheet of it and not break it. It's the thinnest or thickest one layer that we know about. It's 300 times stronger than steel. It has unbelievable thermal conductivity. It's transparent. A hundred y square yards of it would only take up 10 grams of material. And the electrons in this material travel at super fast speeds. And so it's the heart of new quantum materials that can take us beyond 2020 in our needs for electron, electronics and processing of information. So these are just some examples of other atomic layer materials like boron nitride and the works. The other material we're going to we'll talk about is a topological insulator, and it's a material that has some unusual surface properties. It has what's called spin orbital coupling, and that allows electrons to move in only one direction. Electrons cannot do U-turns. And then there's the way that we can make them both in 2D and 3D materials. We also have diamond, and many of us know about diamond, but diamond is also an interesting semiconductor material. And what we do with diamond is we take one of these carbon atoms and we replace it with a nitrogen atom. And if it's in close proximity to a vacancy, it makes what's called an NV center. And this NV center can be used to store information. It's like an artificial single spin system that can store the spin of electrons. And diamond, of course, we know we can put all kinds of color centers in diamond and make all kinds of interesting colors. And here's how we use it, actually, as a storage device. We bring light in at one frequency, and light goes out at another frequency. We bring in green light, and we get red light out. And the intensity of the red light tells us about the state of spin or the memory that this crystal has inside of it. And this is a, another, just a pictorial example of how we can store information. And not only when we talk about four electrons, we get something called entanglement. And when you talk about quantum particles, you have entanglement because there's uncertainty. And when you have this uncertainty, that increases your uh, storage capacity. And so, essentially, we can begin to solve the unsolvable problem by storing information in spin states, like those in diamond. Now, although 
TED Talks are done by individuals. Science is usually done by a team. And so this is a team of scientists that are working on delivering electronic gadgets and gadgets that will take you beyond 2020. So we can solve the unsolvable problem. We can bring health care and bring electronics and information to everybody all on a single chip. You can carry around the Library of Congress in your pocket. You don't have to visit it. This work is being done here at Howard, at Harvard University, and MIT in a collaborative effort, of one of the first of its kind across the country. So I just want to leave you with the, the words of a famous scientist. He said, if quantum hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. So I leave you with those words. And just remember, people can't do what they can't imagine. And this is about a change in our imagination. So we're ready for questions and answers. Thank you very much. what quantum healing is about? Well, I don't know exactly what quantum healing about is, but the concept of quantum is that uh, of that of uncertainty, that you can't measure, you can't measure everything uh, accurately. So I would sp suspect that it has to do with that uncertainty, that uh, the fact that you can't measure both time space or momentum within a certain accuracy. And so there's uncertainty. And that's why an electron and these particles, they really don't exist in the classical sense. They exist as a, what's called a wave packet, which is a distribution of material as opposed to knowing exactly where it is, it's everywhere. Um, how stable are these NV centers? Uh, because at times, I remember when I had, uh, I came like those old floppies. Uh, you can either walk by some uh, like to a metro, or any, anywhere there's like there's a magnet, it distorts the uh, um, your, your data. So when you have your uh, in, in these centers, is it susceptible for, for for your data to be damaged? That's a very good question. So the way we get long-term storage in these devices is that we couple the spin to the what's called the nuclear spin of another atom, like carbon-13. So these NV centers have to be in close proximity to a carbon-13 or some nuclear spin system so that when they store their information for long-term storage, we pass it on to the nuclear system, and the spin system at the nuclear level lasts a very, very long time. So I know it may seem as a very abstract concept to you to think about doing or processing information using light, but there are some tr tremendous advantages to doing that, and that has to do with this entanglement that light is really here, but it's not here. It's there, but it's not there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>